Chapter Seventeen of France and England in North America, Part Three: La Salle Discovery of the Great West. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. France and England in North America, Part Three: La Salle Discovery of the Great West. By Francis Parkman, Jr. Chapter 17 The Adventures of Hennepin It was on the last day of the winter that preceded the invasion of the Iroquois that Father Hennepin, with his two companions, Ecau and Duguay, had set out from Fort Crevecoeur to explore the Illinois to its mouth. It appears from his own later statements, as well as from those of Tonti, that more than this was expected of him, and that La Salle had instructed him to explore not alone the Illinois, but also the upper Mississippi. That he actually did so, there is no reasonable doubt, and could he have contented himself with telling the truth, his name would have stood high as a bold and vigorous discoverer but his vicious attempts to malign his commander and plunder him of his laurels have wrapped his genuine merit in a cloud. Hennepin's first book was published soon after his return from his travels, and while La Salle was still alive. In it he relates the accomplishment of the instructions given him, without the smallest intimation that he did more. Fourteen years after, when La Salle was dead, he published another edition of his travels, in which he advanced a new and surprising pretension. Reasons connected with his personal safety, he declares, before compelled him to remain silent, but a time at length had come when the truth must be revealed, and he proceeds to affirm that, before ascending the Mississippi, he, with his two men, explored its whole course from the Illinois to the sea, thus anticipating the discovery which forms the crowning laurel of La Salle. I am resolved, he says, to make known here to the whole world the mystery of this discovery, which I have hitherto concealed, that I might not offend the Sieur de La Salle, who wish to keep all the glory and all the knowledge of it to himself. It is for this that he sacrificed many persons whose lives he exposed to prevent them from making known what they had seen, and thereby crossing his secret plans. I was certain that if I went down the Mississippi, he would not fail to traduce me to my superiors for not taking the northern route, which I was to have followed in accordance with his desire, and the plan we had made together. But I saw myself on the point of dying of hunger, and knew not what to do, because the two men who were with me threatened openly to leave me in the night, and carry off the canoe and everything in it, if I prevented them from going down the river to the nations below. Finding myself in this dilemma, I thought that I ought not to hesitate, and that I ought to prefer my own safety to the violent passion which possessed the Sieur de la Salle of enjoying alone the glory of this discovery. The two men, seeing that I had made up my mind to follow them, promised me entire fidelity, so, after we had shaken hands together as a mutual pledge, we set out on our voyage. He then proceeds to recount at length the particulars of his alleged exploration. The story was distrusted from the first. Why had he not told it before? An excess of modesty, a lack of self-assertion, or a too sensitive reluctance to wound the susceptibilities of others, had never been found among his foibles. Yet some, perhaps, might have believed him, had he not, in the first edition of his book, gratuitously and distinctly declared that he did not make the voyage in question. We had some designs, he says, of going down the river Colbert, Mississippi, as far as its mouth, but the tribes that took us prisoners gave us no time to navigate this river both up and down. In declaring to the world the achievement which he had so long concealed and so explicitly denied, the worthy missionary found himself in serious embarrassment. In his first book he had stated that on the 12th of March he left the mouth of the Illinois on his way northward, 
and that on the eleventh of april he was captured by the sioux near the mouth of the wisconsin five hundred miles above this would give him only a month to make his alleged canoe voyage from the illinois to the gulf of mexico and again upward to the place of his capture a distance of three thousand two hundred and sixty miles with his means of transportation three months would have been insufficient he saw the difficulty but on the other hand he saw that he could not greatly change either date without confusing the parts of his narrative which preceded and which followed in this perplexity he chose a middle course which only involved him in additional contradictions having as he affirms gone down to the gulf and returned to the mouth of the illinois he set out thence to explore the river above and he assigns the twenty fourth of april as the date of this departure this gives him forty-three days for his voyage to the mouth of the river and back Looking further, we find that having left the Illinois on the 24th, he paddled his canoe 200 leagues northward, and was then captured by the Sioux on the 12th of the same month. In short, he ensnares himself in a hopeless confusion of dates. Here, one would think, is sufficient reason for rejecting his story and yet the general truth of the descriptions and a certain verisimilitude which marks it might easily deceive a careless reader and perplex a critical one these however are easily explained six years before hennepin published his pretended discovery his brother friar father chretien leclerc published an account of the recollet missions among the indians under the title of établissement de la foi this book, offensive to the Jesuits, is said to have been suppressed by order of government, but a few copies fortunately survive. One of these is now before me. It contains the journal of Father Zenob Mambre, on his descent of the Mississippi in 1681, in company with La Salle. The slightest comparison of his narrative with that of Enepin is sufficient to show that the latter framed his own story out of incidents and descriptions furnished by his brother missionary, often using his very words and sometimes copying entire pages, with no other alterations than such as were necessary to make himself, instead of La Salle and his companions, the hero of the exploit. The records of literary piracy may be searched in vain for an act of depredation more recklessly impudent. Such being the case, what faith can we put in the rest of Hennepin's story? Fortunately, there are tests by which the earlier parts of his book can be tried, and on the whole they square exceedingly well with contemporary records of undoubted authenticity. Bating his exaggerations respecting the falls of Niagara, his local descriptions, and even his estimates of distance, are generally accurate. He constantly, it is true, magnifies his own acts, and thrusts himself forward as one of the chiefs of an enterprise to the cost of which he had contributed nothing, and to which he was merely an appendage and yet, till he reaches the Mississippi, there can be no doubt that in the main he tells the truth. As for his ascent of that river to the country of the Sioux, the general statement is fully confirmed by La Salle, Tanti, and other contemporary writers. For the details of the journey we must rest on Hennepin alone, whose account of the country and of the peculiar traits of its Indian occupants afford, as far as they go, good evidence of truth. Indeed, this part of his narrative could only have been written by one well versed in the savage life of this northwestern region. Trusting, then, to his own guidance in the absence of better, let us follow in the wake of his adventurous canoe. It was deeply laden with goods belonging to La Salle, and meant by him as presents to Indians on the way, though the travellers, it appears, proposed to use them in trading on their own account. The friar was still wrapped in his grey capote and hood, shod with sandals, and decorated with the cord of St. Francis. As for his two companions, Acao and Duguay, it is tolerably clear that the former was the real leader of the party, though Hennepin, 
after his custom, thrusts himself into the foremost place. Both were somewhat above the station of ordinary hired hands, and Duguay had an uncle who was an ecclesiastic of good credit at Amiens, his native place. In the forest that overhung the river, the buds were feebly swelling with advancing spring. There was game enough. They killed buffalo, deer, beavers, wild turkeys, and now and then a bear swimming in the river. With these, and the fish which they caught in abundance, they fared sumptuously, though it was the season of Lent. They were exemplary, however, at their devotions. Hennepin said prayers at morning and night, and the Angelus at noon, adding a petition to St. Anthony of Padua that he would save them from the peril that beset their way. In truth there was a lion in the path. The ferocious character of the Sioux, or Dakota, who occupied the region of the upper Mississippi, was already known to the French, and Hennepin, with excellent reason, prayed that it might be his fortune to meet them, not by night, but by day. On the 11th or 12th of April they stopped in the afternoon to repair their canoe, and Hennepin busied himself in daubing it with pitch while the others cooked a turkey. Suddenly a fleet of Sioux canoes swept into sight, bearing a war party of a hundred and twenty naked savages, who, on seeing the travellers, raised a hideous clamour, and, some leaping ashore and others into the water, they surrounded the astonished Frenchmen in an instant. Hennepin held out the peace-pipe, but one of them snatched it from him. Next he hastened to proffer a gift of Martinique tobacco, which was better received. Some of the old warriors repeated the name Miamiha, giving him to understand that they were a war-party on the way to attack the Miamis, on which Hennepin, with the help of signs and of marks which he drew on the sand with a stick, explained that the Miamis had gone across the Mississippi beyond their reach. Hereupon he says that three or four old men placed their hands on his head and began a dismal wailing, while he, with his handkerchief, wiped away their tears, in order to evince sympathy with their affliction, from whatever cause arising. Notwithstanding this demonstration of tenderness, they refused to smoke with him in his peace-pipe, and forced him and his companions to embark and paddle across the river, while they all followed behind, uttering yells and howlings which froze the missionary's blood. On reaching the father's side, they made their campfires and allowed their prisoners to do the same. A cow and Duguay slung their kettle, while Hennepin, to propitiate the Sioux, carried to them two turkeys, of which there were several in the canoe. The warriors had seated themselves in a ring to debate on the fate of the Frenchmen, and two chiefs presently explained to the friar by significant signs that it had been resolved that his head should be split with a war-club. This produced the effect which was no doubt intended. Hennepin ran to the canoe and quickly returned with one of the men, both loaded with presents, which he threw into the midst of the assembly, and then, bowing his head, offered them at the same time a hatchet with which to kill him, if they wished to do so. His gifts and his submission seemed to appease them. They gave him and his companions a dish of beaver's flesh, but to his great concern they returned his peace-pipe, an act which he interpreted as a sign of danger. That night the Frenchmen slept little, expecting to be murdered before morning. There was, in fact, a great division of opinion among the Sioux. Some were for killing them and taking their goods, while others, eager above all things, that French traders should come among them with the knives, hatchets, and guns of which they had heard the value, contended that it would be impolitic to discourage the trade by putting to death its pioneers. Scarcely had morning dawned on the anxious captives when a young chief, naked and painted from head to foot, appeared before them and asked for the pipe, which the friar gladly gave him. He filled it, smoked it, made the warriors do the same, and having given this hopeful pledge of amity, told the Frenchmen that, since the Miamis were out of reach, the war party would return home, and that they must accompany them. 
To this Hennepin gladly agreed, having, as he declares, his great work of exploration so much at heart, that he rejoiced in the prospect of achieving it, even in their company. He soon, however, had a foretaste of the affliction in store for him, for when he opened his breviary and began to mutter his morning devotion, his new companions gathered about him with faces that betrayed their superstitious terror, and gave him to understand that his book was a bad spirit, with which he must hold no more converse. They thought, indeed, that he was muttering a charm for their destruction— a cow and Duguay, conscious of the danger, begged the friar to dispense with his devotions, lest he and they alike should be tomahawked. But Hennepin says that his sense of duty rose superior to his fears, and that he was resolved to repeat his office at all hazards, though not until he had asked pardon of his two friends for thus imperiling their lives. Fortunately, he presently discovered a device by which his devotion and his prudence were completely reconciled. He ceased the muttering which had alarmed the Indians, and with the breviary open on his knees, sang the service in loud and cheerful tones. As this had no savor of sorcery, and as they now imagined that the book was teaching its owner to sing for their amusement, they conceived a favorable opinion of both alike. These Sioux, it may be observed, were the ancestors of those who committed the horrible but not unprovoked massacres of 1862 in the valley of St. Peter. Hennepin complains bitterly of their treatment of him, which, however, seems to have been tolerably good. Afraid that he would lag behind, as his canoe was heavy and slow, they placed several warriors in it to aid him, and his men in paddling. They kept on their way from morning till night, building huts for their bivouac when it rained, and sleeping on the open ground when the weather was fair, which, says Hennepin, gave us a good opportunity to contemplate the moon and stars. The three Frenchmen took the precaution of sleeping at the side of the young chief, who had been the first to smoke the peace pipe, and who seemed inclined to befriend them. But there was another chief, one Aquipaguetin, a crafty old savage, who, having lost a son in war with the Miamis, was angry that the party had abandoned their expedition, and thus deprived him of his revenge. He therefore kept up a dismal lament through half the night, while other old men, crouching over Hennepin as he lay trying to sleep, stroked him with their hands, and uttered wailings so lugubrious that he was forced to the belief that he had been doomed to death, and that they were charitably bemoaning his fate. One night the captives were, for some reason, unable to bivouac near their protector, and were forced to make their fire at the end of the camp. Here they were soon beset by a crowd of Indians, who told them that Aquipaguetin had at length resolved to tomahawk them. The malcontents were gathered in a knot at a little distance, and Hennepin hastened to appease them by another gift of knives and tobacco. This was but one of the devices of the old chief, to deprive them of their goods without robbing them outright. He had with him the bones of a deceased relative, which he was carrying home, wrapped in skins, prepared with smoke after the Indian fashion, and gaily decorated with bands of dyed porcupine quills. He would summon his warriors, and placing these relics in the midst of the assembly, call on all present to smoke in their honor, after which Hennepin was required to offer a more substantial tribute in the shape of cloth, beads, hatchets, tobacco, and the like, to be laid upon the bundle of bones. The gifts thus acquired were then, in the name of the deceased, distributed among the persons present. On one occasion, Aquipaguetin killed a bear, and invited the chiefs and warriors to feast upon it. They accordingly assembled on a prairie west of the river, where, after the banquet, they danced a medicine dance. They were all painted from head to foot, with their hair oiled, garnished with red and white feathers, and powdered with the down of birds. In this guise they set their arms akimbo, and fell to stamping with such fury that the hard prairie was dented with the prints of their moccasins, while the chief's son, crying at the top of his throat, gave to each in turn the pipe of war. 
Meanwhile, the chief himself, singing in a loud and rueful voice, placed his hands on the heads of the three Frenchmen, and from time to time interrupted his music to utter a vehement harangue. Hennepin could not understand the words, but his heart sank as the conviction grew strong within him that these ceremonies tended to his destruction. It seems, however, that after all the chief's efforts, his party was in the minority, the greater part being adverse to either killing or robbing the three strangers. Every morning at daybreak an old warrior shouted the signal of departure, and the recumbent savages leaped up, manned their birchen fleet, and plied their paddles against the current, often without waiting to break their fast. Sometimes they stopped for a buffalo hunt on the neighboring prairies, and there was no lack of provisions. They passed Lake Pepin, which Hennepin called the Lake of Tears, by reason of the howlings and lamentations here uttered over him by a Quipaguetin, and nineteen days after his capture landed near the site of St. Paul. The father's sorrows now began in earnest. The Indians broke his canoe to pieces, having first hidden their own among the alder bushes. As they belonged to different bands and different villages, their mutual jealousy now overcame all their prudence, and each proceeded to claim his share of the captives and the booty. Happily, they made an amicable distribution, or it would have fared ill with the three Frenchmen, and each taking his share, not forgetting the priestly vestments of Hennepin, the splendor of which they could not sufficiently admire. They set out across the country for their villages, which lay towards the north in the neighborhood of Lake Bouad, now called Millac. Being, says Hennepin, exceedingly tall and active, they walked at a prodigious speed, insomuch that no European could long keep pace with them. Though the month of May had begun, there were frosts at night, and the marshes and ponds were glazed with ice, which cut the missionary's legs as he waded through. They swam the larger streams, and Hennepin nearly perished with cold as he emerged from the icy current. His two companions, who were smaller than he, and who could not swim, were carried over on the backs of the Indians. They showed, however, no little endurance, and he declares that he should have dropped by the way but for their support. Seeing him disposed to lag, the Indians to spur him on, set fire to the dry grass behind him, and then, taking him by the hands, ran forward with him to escape the flames. To add to his misery, he was nearly famished, as they gave him only a small piece of smoked meat once a day, though it does not appear that they themselves fared better. On the fifth day, being by this time in extremity, he saw a crowd of squaws and children approaching over the prairie, and presently descried the bark lodges of an Indian town. The goal was reached. He was among the homes of the Sioux. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 1680 and 1681 Enepan among the Sioux as Enepan entered the village, he beheld a sight which caused him to invoke St. Anthony of Padua. In front of the lodges were certain stakes, to which were attached bundles of straw, intended, as he supposed, for burning him and his friends alive. His concern was redoubled when he saw the condition of the Picard du Gay, whose hair and face had been painted with diverse colors, and whose head was decorated with a tuft of white feathers. In this guise he was entering the village, followed by a crowd of Sioux, who compelled him to sing and keep time to his own music by rattling a dried gourd containing a number of pebbles. The omens indeed were exceedingly threatening, for treatment like this was usually followed by the speedy immolation of the captive and Epin ascribes it to the effect of his invocations, that, being led into one of the lodges, among a throng of staring squaws and children, he and his companions were seated on the ground, and presented with large dishes of birch bark, containing a mess of wild rice, boiled with dried whortleberries, a repast which he declares to have been the best that had fallen to his lot since the day of his captivity. 
This soothed his fears, but as he allayed his famished appetite, he listened with anxious interest to the vehement jargon of the chiefs and warriors, who were disputing among themselves to whom the three captives should respectively belong for it seems that as far as related to them the question of distribution had not yet been definitely settled the debate ended in the assigning of Enepin to his old enemy Aquipaguetin, who however far from persisting in his evil designs adopted him on the spot as his son the three companions must now part company. Duguay, not yet quite reassured of his safety, hastened to confess himself to Ennepin, but Akau proved refractory and refused the offices of religion, which did not prevent the friar from embracing them both, as he says, with an extreme tenderness. Tired as he was, he was forced to set out with his self-styled father to his village, which was, fortunately, not far off. An unpleasant walk of a few miles through woods and marshes brought them to the borders of a sheet of water, apparently Lake Buad, where five of Aquipaguetin's wives received the party in three canoes and ferried them to an island on which the village stood. At the entrance of the chief's lodge, Enepin was met by a decrepit old Indian, withered with age, who offered him the peace pipe, and placed him on a bear skin which was spread by the fire. Here, to relieve his fatigue, for he was well nigh spent, a small boy anointed his limbs with the fat of a wild cat, supposed to be sovereign in these cases by reason of the great agility of that animal. His new father gave him a bark platter of fish, covered him with a buffalo robe, and showed him six or seven of his wives, who were thenceforth, he was told, to regard him as a son. The chief's household was numerous, and his allies and relatives formed a considerable clan, of which the missionary found himself an involuntary member. He was scandalized when he saw one of his adopted brothers carrying on his back the bones of a deceased friend, wrapped in the chasubel of brocade which they had taken with other vestments from his box. Seeing their new relative so enfeebled that he could scarcely stand, the Indians made for him one of their sweating baths, where they immersed him in steam three times a week a process from which he thinks he derived great benefit. His strength gradually returned, in spite of his meagre fare, for there was a dearth of food, and the squaws were less attentive to his wants than to those of their children. They respected him, however, as a person endowed with occult powers, and stood in no little awe of a pocket compass which he had with him, as well as of a small metal pot with feet molded after the face of a lion. This last seemed in their eyes a medicine of the most formidable nature, and they would not touch it without first wrapping it in a beaver skin. For the rest, Enepan made himself useful in various ways. He shaved the heads of the children, as was the custom of the tribe, bled certain asthmatic persons, and dosed others with Orviatan, the famous panacea of his time, of which he had brought with him a good supply. With respect to his missionary functions, he seems to have given himself little trouble, unless his attempt to make a Sioux vocabulary is to be regarded as preparatory to a future apostleship. I could gain nothing over them, he says, in the way of their salvation, by reason of their natural stupidity. Nevertheless, on one occasion, he baptized a sick child, naming it Antoinette, in honor of St. Anthony of Padua. It seemed to revive after the rite, but soon relapsed, and presently died, which, he writes, gave me great joy and satisfaction. In this, he was like the Jesuits, who could find nothing but consolation in the death of a newly baptized infant, since it was thus assured of a paradise, which, had it lived, it would probably have forfeited by sharing in the superstitions of its parents. 
With respect to Enipin and his Indian father, there seems to have been little love on either side. But Oasikude, the principal chief of the Sioux of this region, was the fast friend of the three white men. He was angry that they had been robbed, which he had been unable to prevent, as the Sioux had no laws, and their chiefs little power. But he spoke his mind freely, and told Aquipaguetin and the rest in full council that they were like a dog who steals a piece of meat from a dish and runs away with it. When Enipan complained of hunger, the Indians had always promised him that early in the summer he should go with them on a buffalo hunt and have food in abundance. The time at length came, and the inhabitants of all the neighboring villages prepared for departure. To each band was assigned its special hunting ground, and he was expected to accompany his Indian father. To this he demurred, for he feared lest Aquipaguetin, angry at the words of the great chief, might take this opportunity to revenge the insult put upon him. He therefore gave out that he expected a party of spirits, that is to say Frenchmen, to meet him at the mouth of the Wisconsin, bringing a supply of goods for the Indians. And he declares that La Salle had in fact promised to send traders to that place. Be this as it may, the Indians believed him, and true or false, the assertion, as will be seen, answered the purpose for which it was made. The Indians set out in a body to the number of two hundred and fifty warriors, with their women and children. The three Frenchmen, who, though in different villages had occasionally met during the two months of their captivity, were all of the party. They descended Rum River, which forms the outlet of Millac, and which is called the St. Francis by Enipan. None of the Indians had offered to give him passage and fearing lest he should be abandoned, he stood on the bank, hailing the passing canoes, and begging to be taken in. A cow and duguay presently appeared, paddling a small canoe which the Indians had given them, but they would not listen to the missionary's call, and a cow, who had no love for him, cried out that he had paddled him long enough already. Two Indians, however, took pity on him, and brought him to the place of encampment, where Duguay tried to excuse himself for his conduct, but a cow was sullen and kept aloof. After reaching the Mississippi, the whole party encamped together opposite to the mouth of Rum River, pitching their tents of skin, or building their bark huts on the slope of a hill by the side of the water. It was a wild scene, this camp of savages, among whom as yet no traders had come, and no handiwork of civilization had found its way. The tall warriors, some nearly naked, some wrapped in buffalo robes, and some in shirts of dressed deerskin, fringed with hair, and embroidered with dyed porcupine quills, War clubs of stone in their hands, and quivers at their backs, filled with stone-headed arrows. The squaws, cutting smoke-dried meat with knives of flint, and boiling it in rude earthen pots of their own making, driving away, meanwhile, with shrill cries, the troops of lean dogs, which disputed the meal with a crew of hungry children. The whole camp, indeed, was threatened with starvation. The three white men could get no food but unripe berries, from the effects of which Enipan thinks they might all have died, but for timely doses of his orvietan. Being tired of the Indians, he became anxious to set out for the Wisconsin to find the party of Frenchmen, real or imaginary, who were to meet him at that place. That he was permitted to do so was due to the influence of the great chief Oasi Kude, who always befriended him, and who had soundly berated his two companions for refusing him a seat in their canoe. Duguay wished to go with him, but Akau, who liked the Indian life as much as he disliked Enipan, preferred to remain with the hunters. A small birch canoe was given to the two adventurers, together with an earthen pot, and they had also between them a gun, a knife, and a robe of beaver skin. 
Thus equipped, they began their journey, and soon approached the falls of St. Anthony, so named by Enipan in honor of the inevitable St. Anthony of Padua. As they were carrying their canoe by the cataract, they saw five or six Indians who had gone before, and one of whom had climbed into an oak tree beside the principal fall whence in a loud and lamentable voice he was haranguing the spirit of the waters as a sacrifice to whom he had just hung a robe of beaver skin among the branches their attention was soon engrossed by another object looking over the edge of the cliff which overhung the river below the falls enipan saw a snake which as he avers was six feet long writhing upward towards the holes of the swallows in the face of the precipice in order to devour their young he pointed him out to duguay and they pelted him with stones till he fell into the river but not before his contortions and the darting of his forked tongue had so affected the picard's imagination that he was haunted that night with a terrific incubus they paddled sixty leagues down the river in the heats of July, and killed no large game, but a single deer, the meat of which soon spoiled. Their main resource was the turtles, whose shyness and watchfulness caused them frequent disappointments and many involuntary fasts. They once captured one of more than common size, and as they were endeavoring to cut off his head he was near avenging himself by snapping off hennepin's finger there was a herd of buffalo in sight on the neighboring prairie and duguay went with his gun in pursuit of them leaving the turtle in hennepin's custody scarcely was he gone when the friar raising his eyes saw that their canoe which they had left at the edge of the water had floated out into the current Hastily turning the turtle on his back, he covered him with his habit of St. Francis, on which, for greater security, he laid a number of stones, and then, being a good swimmer, struck out in pursuit of the canoe, which he at length overtook. Finding that it would overset if he tried to climb into it, he pushed it before him to the shore, and then paddled towards the place at some distance above where he had left the turtle. He had no sooner reached it than he heard a strange sound, and beheld a long line of buffalo, bulls, cows, and calves, entering the water not far off, to cross to the western bank. Having no gun, as became his apostolic vocation, he shouted to Duguay, who presently appeared, running in all haste, and they both paddled in pursuit of the game. Duguay aimed at a young cow and shot her in the head. She fell in shallow water near an island where some of the herd had landed, and being unable to drag her out, they waded into the water and butchered her where she lay. It was forty-eight hours since they had tasted food, and Epin made a fire while Duguay cut up the meat. They feasted so bountifully that they both fell ill and were forced to remain two days on the island, taking doses of Orvietan, before they were able to resume their journey. Apparently they were not sufficiently versed in woodcraft to smoke the meat of the cow, and the hot sun soon robbed them of it. They had a few fish hooks, but were not always successful in the use of them. On one occasion, being nearly famished, they set their line and lay watching it, uttering prayers in turn. Suddenly there was a great turmoil in the water. Duguay ran to the line, and with the help of Enipan, drew in two large catfish. The eagles, or fish-hawks, now and then dropped a newly caught fish, of which they gladly took possession and once they found a purveyor in an otter which they saw by the bank devouring some object of an appearance so wonderful that duguay cried out that he had a devil between his paws they scared him from his prey which proved to be a spade fish or as enipan correctly describes it a species of sturgeon with a bony projection from his snout in the shape of a paddle they broke their fast upon him, undeterred by this eccentric appendage. 
If Enipan had had an eye for scenery, he would have found in these his vagabond rovings wherewith to console himself in some measure for his frequent fasts. The young Mississippi, fresh from its northern springs, unstained as yet by unhallowed union with the riotous Missouri, flowed calmly on its way amid strange and unique beauties. A wilderness, clothed with velvet grass, forest-shadowed valleys, lofty heights, whose smooth slopes seemed leveled with the scythe, domes and pinnacles, ramparts and ruined towers, the work of no human hand. The canoe of the voyagers, borne on the tranquil current, glided in the shade of grey crags festooned with honeysuckles, by trees mantled with wild grapevines, dells bright with the flowers of the white euphorbia, the blue gentian, and the purple balm, and matted forests where the red squirrels leaped and chattered. They passed the great cliff whence the Indian maiden threw herself in her despair, and Lake Pepin lay before them, slumbering in the July sun. The far-reaching sheets of sparkling water, the woody slopes, the tower-like crags, the grassy heights basking in sunlight or shadowed by the passing cloud, all the fair outline of its graceful scenery, the finished and polished masterwork of nature. And when at evening they made their bivouac fire and drew up their canoe, while dim sultry clouds veiled the west, and the flashes of the silent heat lightning gleamed on the leaden water, they could listen, as they smoked their pipes, to the mournful cry of the whippoorwills and the quavering scream of the owls. Other thoughts than the study of the picturesque occupied the mind of Enipin when one day he saw his Indian father, Aguipaguetin, whom he had supposed five hundred miles distant, descended the river with ten warriors in canoes. He was eager to be the first to meet the traders, who, as Enipin had given out, were to come with their goods to the mouth of the Wisconsin. The two travelers trembled for the consequences of this encounter, but the chief, after a short colloquy, passed on his way. In three days he returned in ill humor, having found no traders at the appointed spot. The Picard was absent at the time, looking for game, and Enipan was sitting under the shade of his blanket, which he had stretched on forked sticks to protect him from the sun, when he saw his adopted father approaching, with a threatening look, and a war-club in his hand. He attempted no violence, however, but suffered his wrath to exhale in a severe scolding, after which he resumed his course up the river with his warriors. If Enipin, as he avers, really expected a party of traders at the Wisconsin, the course he now took is sufficiently explicable. If he did not expect them, his obvious course was to rejoin Tonti on the Illinois, for which he seems to have had no inclination, or to return to Canada by way of the Wisconsin, an attempt which involved the risk of starvation, as the two travelers had but ten charges of powder left. Assuming then his hope of the traders to have been real, he and Duguay resolved in the meantime to join a large body of Sioux hunters, who, as Equipaguetin had told them, were on a stream which he calls Bull River, now the Chippeway, entering the Mississippi near Lake Pepin. By so doing they would gain a supply of food and save themselves from the danger of encountering parties of roving warriors. They found this band, among whom was their companion Akau, and followed them on a grand hunt along the borders of the Mississippi. Duguay was separated for a time from Enipan, who was placed in a canoe with a withered squaw more than eighty years old. In spite of her age, she handled her paddle with great address, and used it vigorously, as occasion required, to repress the gambols of three children, who, to Hannibal's annoyance, occupied the middle of the canoe. The hunt was successful. The Sioux warriors, active as deer, chased the buffalo on foot with their stone-headed arrows on the plains behind the heights that bordered the river while the old men stood sentinels at the top, watching for the approach of enemies. 
One day an alarm was given. The warriors rushed toward the supposed point of danger, but found nothing more formidable than two squaws of their own nation, who brought strange news. A war party of Sioux, they said, had gone towards Lake Superior, and had met by the way five spirits, that is to say, five Europeans. Annepin was full of curiosity to learn who the strangers might be, and they, on their part, were said to have shown great anxiety to know the nationality of the three white men who, as they were told, were on the river. The hunt was over, and the hunters, with Annepin and his companion, were on their way northward to their towns, when they met the five spirits at some distance below the falls of St. Anthony. They proved to be Daniel Gresselon de Lutte, with four well-armed Frenchmen. This bold and enterprising man, stigmatized by the Intendant du Chenot as a leader of Coureur du Bois, was a cousin of Tanti, born at Lyon. He belonged to that caste of the lesser nobles whose name was Legion, and whose admirable military qualities shone forth so conspicuously in the wars of Louis the Fourteenth, Though his enterprises were independent of those of La Salle, they were at this time carried on in connection with Count Frontenac and certain merchants in his interest, of whom de Lutte's uncle Patron was one, while Louvigny, his brother-in-law, was in alliance with the governor, and was an officer of his guard. Here, then, was a kind of family league, countenanced by Frontenac, and acting conjointly with him, in order, if the angry letters of the intendant are to be believed, to reap a clandestine profit under the shadow of the governor's authority, and in violation of the royal ordinances. The rudest part of the work fell to the share of Delou, who, with a persistent hardihood, not surpassed perhaps even by La Salle, was continually in the forest, in the Indian towns, or in remote wilderness outposts planted by himself, exploring, trading, fighting, ruling lawless savages and whites scarcely less ungovernable, and on one or more occasions varying his life by crossing the ocean to gain interviews with the colonial minister Senilet amid the splendid vanities of Versailles. Strange to say, this man of hardy enterprise was a martyr to the gout, which for more than a quarter of a century grievously tormented him, though for a time he thought himself cured by the intercession of the Iroquois saint Catherine Tegacuita, to whom he had made a vow to that end. He was, without doubt, an habitual breaker of the royal ordinances regulating the fur trade. Yet his services were great to the colony and to the crown, and his name deserves a place of honor among the pioneers of American civilization. When Enipan met him, he had been about two years in the wilderness. In September 1678, he left Quebec for the purpose of exploring the region of the Upper Mississippi and establishing relations of friendship with the Sioux and their kindred, the Assiniboine. In the summer of 1679, he visited three large towns of the eastern division of the Sioux, including those visited by Ennepin in the following year, and planted the king's arms in all of them. Early in the autumn he was at the head of Lake Superior, holding a council with the Assiniboine and the Lake tribes, and inducing them to live at peace with the Sioux. In all this he acted in a public capacity, under the authority of the governor, but it is not to be supposed that he forgot his own interests or those of his associates. The intendant angrily complains that he aided and abetted the Coureurs du Bois in their lawless courses, and sent down in their canoes great quantities of beaver skins consigned to the merchants in league with him, under cover of whose names the governor reaped his share of the profits. In June 1680, while Ennepin was in the Sioux villages, Dulou set out from the head of Lake Superior with two canoes, four Frenchmen, and an Indian, to continue his explorations. 
he ascended a river, apparently the burnt wood, and reached from thence a branch of the Mississippi, which seems to have been the St. Croix. It was now that, to his surprise, he learned that there were three Europeans on the main river below, and fearing that they might be Englishmen or Spaniards encroaching on the territories of the king, he eagerly pressed forward to solve his doubts. When he saw Ennepin, his mind was set at rest, and the travellers met with mutual cordiality. They followed the Indians to their villages of Milac, where Ennepin had now no reason to complain of their treatment of him. The Sioux gave him and Duluth a grand feast of honour, at which were seated a hundred and twenty naked guests, and the great chief Oasicude, with his own hands, placed before Ennepin a bark dish containing a mess of smoked meat and wild rice. Autumn had come, and the travellers bethought them of going home. The Sioux, consoled by their promises to return with goods for trade, did not oppose their departure, and they set out together, eight white men in all. As they passed St. Anthony's Falls, two of the men stole two buffalo robes, which were hung on trees as offerings to the spirit of the cataract. When Duluth heard of it, he was very angry, telling the men that they had endangered the lives of the whole party. And Epan admitted that in the view of human prudence, he was right but urged that the act was good and praiseworthy, inasmuch as the offerings were made to a false god, while the men, on their part, proved mutinous, declaring that they wanted the robes and meant to keep them. The travellers continued their journey in great ill-humour, but were presently soothed by the excellent hunting which they found on the way. As they approached the Wisconsin, they stopped to dry the meat of the buffalo they had killed, when to their amazement they saw a war-party of Sioux approaching in a fleet of canoes. And Epan represents himself as showing on this occasion an extraordinary courage, going to meet the Indians with a peace-pipe, and instructing Dulu, who knew more of these matters than he, how he ought to behave. The Sioux proved not unfriendly, and said nothing of the theft of the buffalo robes. They soon went on their way to attack the Illinois and Missouris, leaving the Frenchmen to ascend the Wisconsin unmolested. After various adventures, they reached the station of the Jesuits at Green Bay, but its existence is wholly ignored by Ennepin, whose zeal for his own order will not permit him to allude to this establishment of the rival missionaries. He is equally reticent with regard to the Jesuit mission at Michilimackinac, where the party soon after arrived, and where they spent the winter. The only intimation which he gives of its existence consists in the mention of the Jesuit Pearson, who was a Fleming like himself, and who often skated with him on the frozen lake, or kept him company in fishing through a hole in the ice. When the spring opened, an abound descended Lake Huron, followed the Detroit to Lake Erie, and proceeded thence to Niagara. Here he spent some time in making a fresh examination of the cataract, and then resumed his voyage on Lake Ontario. He stopped, however, at the great town of the Senecas, near the Genesee, where, with his usual spirit of meddling, he took upon him the functions of the civil and military authorities, convoked the chiefs to a council, and urged them to set at liberty certain Ottawa prisoners, whom they had captured in violation of treaties. Having settled this affair to his satisfaction, he went to Fort Frontenac, where his brother missionary, Buisset, received him with a welcome rendered the warmer by a story which had reached him that the Indians had hanged Ennepin with his own court of St. Francis. From Fort Frontenac he went to Montreal, and leaving his two men on a neighboring island that they might escape the payment of duties on a quantity of furs which they had with them, he paddled alone towards the town. Count Frontenac chanced to be here, and looking from the window of a house near the river, he saw approaching in a canoe a recollet father, 
whose appearance indicated the extremity of hard service, for his face was worn and sunburnt, and his tattered habit of St. Francis was abundantly patched with scraps of buffalo skin. When at length he recognized the long-lost Anipan, he received him, as the father writes, with all the tenderness which a missionary could expect from a person of his rank and quality. He kept him for twelve days in his own house, and listened with interest to such of his adventures as the friar sought fit to divulge. And here we bid farewell to Father Anipan. Providence, he writes, preserved my life that I might make known my great discoveries to the world. He soon after went to Europe, where the story of his travels found a host of readers, but where he died at last in a deserved obscurity.